Hundreds of people have been tying their flies with Driftstone slotted tungsten beads now, and it's unanimous. They're the best. They've got the tightest slots in the industry, so they're heavier and you need fewer thread wraps to lock them in. Tie faster and save money because our 50 packs are the best value out there. If you're not a tire, that's okay. You can pick up my favorite patterns hand tied by me using the same exact beads. Check them out and more at driftstone.co. On the show today, I have internet sensation Flyfish Dan. He hails from the Pacific Northwest, and today we're going to talk about his brand new fly rod company called Fish On Fly Rods. Hi, and welcome, Dan. Let's just uh, talk about some fly fishing stuff, shall we? Good to be here, Eric. Thanks for inviting me. You're very welcome. Uh, have you been fishing lately? Um, you know, I did. I had an afternoon uh, of fishing here recently, one of my favorite streams over in Washington. But I'm super excited about this weekend because I extended a trip out here to Bend to kind of push into the weekend. So I'm doing a little fishing yeah. uh, late this afternoon and tomorrow. So I'm looking forward to that. Is the steelhead running or is that what you're looking for? Well, I mean, if uh, it's it's more the red band trout. Steelhead would just be a, a like a, a super awesome bonus, but they haven't had a lot of rain over here yet, so I guess they haven't really moved up in the river system. There are a few, so there's a chance that I might get lucky because uh, steelhead is kind of my kryptonite on the fly, fly rod. So it's hard. It's been since 2006 since I last caught a steelhead on the fly rod. It's been a very long time. Interesting. I mean, what kind of techniques do you like to use? Do you swing flies or what are you doing? So I'm, I'm typically swinging flies, but I did, I did read some things about this particular river I'm going to. There's, there's chance, chances to nymph them up. So I've got a few steelhead nymphs, you know, some really big, they basically look like a really big stone fly with colored beads. Mm -hmm. So I, I will probably have one of those on my trout setup. So I'll probably run the steelhead, you know, nymph, and then do like a TJ hooker dropper for the trout. So two in one opportunity, but I did bring, I'm learning to, to trout spay. Mm -hmm. So I tried spay rod fishing, but I still need a lot of practice And those uh, rods for me are just tough on my wrists and my shoulder. And I know it's about technique, right? Cause it's supposed to be easier to cast, mm -hmm. but I put way too much effort into it to where after an hour of trying this spay casting on a true, like, like great big salmon or steelhead spay rod, it was too hard on my body, so hmm. I actually uh, designed, along with my rod builder, uh, a switch rod. So it's a trout spay, lighter. It's a three-four setup, really lightweight blank, eleven feet long. And I took it out to one of my favorite rivers in Washington, Yakima River, uh, one of my first times, and hooked up to a couple fish. One big one that I ended up losing, but I was able to cast it pretty easily without a lot of effort. So. It might be due to practicing and, and figuring out how to do it, but I'll have that with me. It'll be pretty entertaining if I end up hooking up with a steelhead on that rod, but I'm just swinging small streamers on that rod. Mm, okay. I, I just recently got to go on a spay trip with a guide, so I had some excellent instruction, and uh, that uh, was an education to say the least. It, for me, it, it didn't feel harder like physically like you're talking about, but more... Yeah, I just slow everything way down. Like it's just very methodical, and once you kind of figure it out, it, it's very satisfying. We didn't catch many fish either, but uh, I'm thinking of selling one of my rods to pick up a two-handed setup. Yeah, and I actually, you know, there is definitely technique, right? And um, I'd gotten a lesson from Alicia Littleleaf. They guide out of Warm Springs, and it's a great lesson. And I was trying to recall what she was saying, but looking back, I was adding an extra movement into the rod that I didn't need to and consequently I somehow brought the cast too close to me and I punched a hole in my waders with a fly strike that's how like hard in the back? The fly, yeah wow. it, it, well no it hit me like right at the waist but it punched a hole in my waders because I did some weird motion and the whipping action of the fly hit me so hard that it punched a hole in four ply waders it was nuts wow. it made a very loud boom and i was actually happy that it hit the waders and not my skin but mm -hmm. but so now i'm i'm uh i think i've, I've re-watched her tutorial and i know what i was doing wrong now so i'm able to keep everything kind of away from me mm -hmm. uh, so that doesn't happen again but that's kind of scary when 
you can accelerate a fly fast enough to where it would actually punch a hole in a heavy set of waders. Yeah, I think uh, fishing barbless is kind of mandatory for that as well. I would yeah. hate to rip one of those out of the back of your head or whatnot. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, for sure. You mentioned the TJ Hooker up on where you're going to be fishing around Bend, and uh, that kind of dates you. I don't know many people if even know what that fly is. Uh, so you've been fishing your whole life, and I mean, you're kind of what I would consider like an old school fisherman. You fish fly line, you fish all the conventional fly styles, per se, but where on earth did you get the idea to start a YouTube channel? How did you get here? You know, it's an interesting story, Eric. Um, so back three years ago, during the, during right when the pandemic started, there was a lot of scary news out there, right? A lot of, a lot of uncertainty, both with the pandemic and how it was going to affect the economy and, of course, the politics and the civil unrest and, and I was fixating on that way too much and not in a very healthy way. So my wife encouraged me to do something different. She goes, why don't you start up a YouTube channel and just put your energy into something that's positive? So that was a light bulb moment for me and I thought, all right, yeah, I think I could do that. So that, I mean, and immediately, as soon as I started, I realized this is, this is fun. And even though, you know, of course, in the beginning, right, you start with zero subscribers and your first video, which was horrible, might get, you know, 40 views or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, it was a great positive distraction for me. And I knew right away that I, I wanted to have a positive message as well uh, in, in my YouTube channel. And I think how it organically grew is great positive distraction for me. And in kind of a crazy world at that particular time, it became that for others as well. People to try just to escape the negativity and all of the, the turmoil that was happening in life that they could just kind of, you know, immerse themselves into a video that really is just nothing but positive vibes. And, and organically, it just didn't feel right for me to just, hey, watch, go, watch Dan go fishing. So I added some educational pieces in there as well. And that's kind of how it evolved into into where we are today but that's how it started was uh my wife uh, just saying you know do something different start a youtube channel for sure well i think that your educational bent has kind of led to a lot of your success I, a lot of people i mean myself i don't do a whole lot of teaching on my channel other than sort of like watching what i'm doing and i might explain things here and there but i don't really do tips like you do and that's definitely uh something I, i'll point people to you and they're like who's dan i'll mention him. oh he's the fish on guy i'm like oh yeah that guy and uh the people just resonate with your your easy little short three minute tutorials on how to get a longer cast or whatever it may be you're talking about yeah and i try to i'm, I'm you know i don't consider myself an expert i have a ton of practical knowledge and uh, i try to teach that way right uh, as you probably know our sport has a bit of a a there's a reputation there of elitism, right? And that's why a lot of people want to avoid it. You know, they think they have to know too much or have a certain net worth <laughs> to be able to start fly fishing. So I try to strip all that out, right? Fly fishing is for everyone. Anyone can get into it. You don't need to know all the nomenclature. You don't need to know all the billions of minutia that goes into this sport. You just need to have just kind of a high level basic knowledge like I do and you can have success. So I think that's also been a, an appeal to a lot of people as, as well is that, you know, I don't know all the names of every single bug that I tie on or fly that I tie on. I'm not absolutely certain of the abs the size of hook that I'm, that I'm using or the fly that I'm using. I don't know. You know, I know a little bit of it, but I don't know all of it because you don't need to. Mm -hmm. It's just one of those places I never got stuck in the weeds is what I used to call it. So. Yeah, I think especially with entomology, that can be a big roadblock for a lot of people. They think they got to know all the hatches and have 65,000 flies to match every single emergence. And you're right. It's like, that's like, that can be fun. I mean, if that's your thing, go for it. I mean, get all nerdy about that if you want to. But I think uh, simplifying it for the average person is definitely important. Because like you said, with the elitism, uh, it can be off-putting. Let's put it that way. <laughs> You know, it's crazy, too, uh, about, you know, all the different flies and the entomology part of it. I've talked about in several videos, and if I think about in any given year how many different flies that I tie on, it's probably no more than 
24 different variations. Mm. But yet, I've got a pack full of probably a thousand flies, most of which that have never, ever touched the water. And and I ran into, I frequent a shop by my house, the Puget Sound Fly Company, often. And I just happened to be in there and uh, Matt's fly tire, who designs a lot of the the different steelhead flies and that type of thing and bass flies was in there. Okay. And I looked over his shoulder and said, that looks like a good looking pattern. And he goes, this one's definitely for the fly fisher. <laughs> it's not for really catching fish. Mm. And he says, you know, 90% of what I tie is for the angler because, mm-hmm. and that's really true, right? Because we think it looks great and, oh, this is bright. It might, it might catch fish. And, and I get caught up in that too, buying a bunch of stuff that looks great. But the reality is this green, ugly, rubber-legged bug that I generally tie on as my prospecting fly works every single time. For real? A green one, huh? I, green or brown. Okay. Because I know, I know like back more, east more in, in Pennsylvania, things like the green weenie are really popular. But out west, not many people fish a lot of green stuff. So that's cool. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I almost everything is olive, right? The Sculpzilla that I use primarily is olive, green. Um, the TJ hooker that I use has kind of an olive brown, uh, to it as well. Um, yeah, I've always, I've always liked kind of that natural color, uh, color for my fly on the green. Even, even when I'm using a lot of dry flies, a lot of times they're kind of in a green color Mm -hmm. as well. A lot of red though, too. Interesting. Well, I mean, confidence is such a big part of it. I mean, when you know you've caught a thousand fish before that you'll probably catch some more tomorrow, no matter what the bugs are doing. Totally. And you're right. Yeah, that's a great point, right? Because I know when I tie on the TJ hooker, I'm going to catch a fish, right? So that, so I'm casting it away. I'm presenting it away. I'm just waiting for that indicator to go down because I know it's going to work. And you're right. A lot of it has to do with just my own mental, you know, state, knowing that I've caught a lot of fish on this fly, so it's going to work. So you project that, and a lot of times it, it uh, everything else falls into place, and you end up catching fish. That's awesome for sure. Well, I, I think that's. I, I was just helping somebody recently who was a beginner. They, they they didn't have any fishing experience, didn't even come from a spinning background. And they had been consuming lots and lots of YouTube. And they had a good picture in their mind of like what a drift under maybe a bobber would look like. And I think it's just one of those things you just got to do it enough to finally get a fish on to sort of connect all those dots together that you've painted in your mind. And, and then from there, it's just like, oh, it's a whole new world. But I remember that experience personally, too, when I was beginning uh, not quite as long as you, maybe four years or five years ago. Now I'm fairly new, really, to the sport. But it's just, it's cool making those connections and just exploring and going down the steps of learning. I agree. And, you know, it's, what's interesting also, even though I've been doing this now for almost 40 years, when I started the YouTube channel, it really did, you know, I'm still growing in fly fishing. And now that there's this... Well, the spay rod, for example. Yeah, Exactly. There's an inherent responsibility, right, to to make sure that what you're teaching is also correct, right? So I've I've forced me to dive a little bit deeper mm-hmm. into certain categories to make sure that you know I'm teaching in a way that, of course, is 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 right and accurate, but also what works for me as well. So I've grown a ton myself, especially within my casting tutorials. I watching myself back, I saw that I was making a few errors that I was trying to teach. So I've, I've even leveled up my game just based on the fact that I'm paying more attention to what I'm doing as well. That's so cool. I mean, the, the internet will police you too. So I'm assuming, I remember you, that, you? that silly video you were talking about the haters reading your comments that somebody, when you were casting, you were flailing your arms or something. And I just <laughs> right, like it. it made me laugh. That was bad. Yeah. I know it's, you know, those are, those are therapy videos for myself. Um, I mean, as, as you know, being in, in the social media world as well, I have to take a step back a lot of times because the reality is 95% of the interactions and comments are positive, mm-hmm. 5% are negative, but it's, <laughs> it's really easy to get focused in on the negative. Uh, and sometimes I got to step back, remember my why, remember all the people that I've reached in a positive way, and it helps me filter out you know, some of these pretty nasty comments that that come on occasion on youtube um but doing the videos uh, is is somewhat therapeutic because in my own way i can respond to some of those 
those comments. And that last video was so popular and so many people were like, you know, we want to see this as a regular thing. I had several comments that didn't make the cut. So I'm going to, I'm going to record something this weekend right on. with the rest of the comments. Cause some of them are just like, what well, the, the heck? Theme show theme that you have put on the video. It's just very entertaining. You have a funny way of uh, laughing at yourself and them at the same time. It's, it's entertaining for sure. Yeah, totally. Well, so you talk about learning and, uh, not wanting to share information that's wrong, but uh, how do you go from, I don't know, a lifetime of fly fishing to a rod company? I want to know more details. I like to nerd out on this kind of stuff. That is a interesting story. And thanks for, uh, thanks for asking about that as well. So part of, part of my YouTube journey is, you know, I found early on and this, you know, it wasn't in, it wasn't even in my uh, thought in my mind in the beginning People were asking me about the gear that I use. And all of a sudden, you know, what, what do you use for this? What do you use for that? What, what do you prefer in waders? What do you prefer in gear packs? What do you prefer in, in nippers? I mean, all these, pretty much right. anything and everything. What do you for, prefer in fly line? So all of a sudden now there's this responsibility, right? If I'm, if I'm gonna be putting my name on something, I've gotta be able to trust it, right? So that's why I've aligned with only certain brands and manufacturers along the way. I have a few sponsorships, um, but all those sponsorships are brands that I've used in the past or have had friends that use in the past and they're trusted brands, right? Because I'm not going to recommend anything that I don't believe in and trust. So along the way, about three years ago, I had a rod builder reach out to me um, and he wanted to make me my first bamboo fly rod if I just gave him a shout out. So wow. he made me this beautiful rod. And of course I gave him a shout out. His name is Neil Fox. Does a great job with, with building rods. Just a beautiful rod. I mean, it's, I almost am afraid to use it cause it's, it's like a piece of, of art. art. Yeah. Right. But I got to get it out more, but a lot of times it's like, ugh, you know, it's, it's tough to get out that rod, <clears throat> even though it's super functional. Mm. But anyway, I wanted to help him. He's a was sole proprietor, right? Just had his own business. So I wanted to try to help him uh, sell more spay rods is what he sells and bamboo rods. Uh, so I tried to connect him with people in the industry. And one of the things that we did, we tried to do about a year ago is I, I had a thought, right? Uh, you go into any fly shop and you pretty much see the same series of branded fly rods, right? We all know the big mm -hmm. brands mm -hmm. that, are, that are all in there. Yep. So I thought, you know, why don't, uh, I encouraged Neil to go in there and I set a couple of meetings up with him with some of the fly shop owners that I knew to build a branded fly rod for that fly shop, right? It could be their color scheme, their branding, just have something unique to them. Mm -hmm. Well, they, the owners were very cordial and listened to the, the, the sales presentation, essentially what it was. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, they did not want to alienate their relationships with some of these big rod manufacturers. So they didn't want to bring in something that was customized that was not name brand. And at the same time, I was looking into some sponsorships on some of the big fly rod brands that I trusted as well. And for the same reason, they didn't want to uh, sponsor me because they didn't want to alienate their relationships with the fly shops. So we had this kind of uh, situation at play to where Neil couldn't get into the fly shops because they didn't want to alienate their relationships with big brands. Big brands didn't want to fully sponsor me because they didn't want to alienate their relationships with the fly shops. Interesting. So I came to Neil with a business proposal and I said, well, why don't we build, why don't we design and build a, a fly rod uh, uh, for me, right? And brand it to, to my own. So we, we did a lot of research. We did several months of research on on you know what we were looking for you know what type of rod do we want to build you know who is my core audience who do i want to reach with this fly rod and it what we ended up settling on is that i wanted to build you know a lot of times high-end gear right it, it's not necessarily accessible for everyone right not everyone has the ability to go buy an eight nine hundred thousand dollar twelve hundred dollar fly rod it's just, they can't, right? And uh, sure. even myself, when I, when I go look at a, a new fly rod, when I see that price point, it's just like, oh my uh, God, that's a lot to spend. Right. Now, granted, I, I know you get what you pay for and everything else, but still, that's a big, that's a big chunk to bite off on 
an any fly rod. And I'm sure after watching one of your videos, and I think you broke two rods in yep. one trip. One trip, 100%. Yeah. To have to invest now quite a bit of money, right, to get yourself back into the game if, if the manufacturers won't fix those rods. It's, it's not cheap. So I wanted to design a rod that was on an eight nine hundred thousand dollars spec by using all the same type of components right and neil has been building fly rods he built his first fly rod when he was like 14 years old wow and you know he's now uh about uh, 60 years old i'm sure you won't mind me telling him how old he is he's about 60 years old so he has a lot of, a lot of years right he's been in in business doing this he was doing it for friends and family for decades and then in 2018, uh, officially opened up his his business under under his banner. Right on. So he has a l- lot of connections both with distributors in and around the U.S. and around the world and factories in and around the U.S. and around the world. So he has access to these components, these high-end components. So we designed a rod and I didn't want to do fast action, even though I preferred fast action rods. Uh, it's just something I got used to after using the Sage TCR for decades. I just like that fast action, okay. lighter setup that can throw heavier flies. We knew that that rod wouldn't be for everyone, right? Uh, because you have to have a, a, a very, very good understanding of, of the dynamics of a fly rod to be able to use that efficiently. So we found a taper and it was a, it was a taper that Neil had been using on several of his customized rods that he built my first prototype and it was a it was a carbon fiber and it's positioned as a parabolic power taper so it is a medium fast action um and when he built my five weight the first thing that i noticed was how easy it was to cast right it really was very little effort to get 40 50 60 feet of line out uh with with relative ease and i was up in alaska when i made the first video kind of introducing the the, the five weight, this prototype that we put together. And I did a, I did a casting. I had the, I was fishing with a, with a friend of mine and he filmed me doing the cast and I slowed it down and I could see this bend, right? It literally would start just above the cork and it would translate all the way through the rod. So it was this very even bend. And also when you did the hard stop to go back on the back cast, there wouldn't be any recoil in the rod at all, right? It would immediately snap back and start going in the opposite direction without any wobble. Okay. So immediately I I knew that we had a special casting rod and one of our, we've had a couple of our clients specifically email just saying, Hey, you know, I've had the fly rod out. It's that one guy called it the, the most efficient energy transfer from fly rod to fly line he's ever casted. Hmm. That's that's quite an endorsement. It is, yeah, and and this guy was a guide as well. So it it he he had been using a lot of other brands. In fact, this particular guy went away from a sponsorship because he wasn't having the great greatest uh, experience in quality, and is now buying our fly rods because he is having a phenomenal great experience. Yeah, it really is pretty cool. Um, So and that's what I also. I, I experienced myself casting these rods. They were just an easier casting rod. And of course, being, you know, that uh, British racing green, people love that green color and it just really pops when you put the epoxy on it to making sure that we have enough coatings of epoxy, right? I recently took back a fly rod to a manufacturer and the manufacturer said I wore it out what? because the UV just finally got through the epoxy and started to grade the wraps and the rod was done. So wow. after almost 20 years of use, it was toast. Now, granted, I fish a lot more than most people do. Sure. But we wanted to make sure that we had a coating on the rod that could that could truly last a lifetime so you could pass that rod down to the next generation of fly fishers and it would still be in good shape. Neil, and this is also unique to what we do, he hand turns all the cork. So we, we hand pick... They call it a fluorated cork, which is the higher end grade of cork. And they just come in these little rounds. Okay. He puts them together, builds them, turns them, and forms them. So every cork is slightly different than the next because everyone has been uh, hand-turned. But all the components that, that go into a fly rod, you can cheapen it up, right, to increase your margins. Mm-hmm. But you're going to get that result in the fly rod. So we took low margins. Both Neil and I don't make a ton of money on these fly rods. 
but we build a fly rod that typically would cost $1,000 uh, and price it anywhere between $400 and $500 for that fly rod. And it is a quality fly rod. In fact, you know, I'm not using these FFD rods because uh, I'm trying to promote my business. I, I continue to use them and I haven't pulled out any other fly rod that I have. And I have a lot in my quiver because I really enjoy how these perform both in, you know, the casting. I don't have to put a lot of effort into cast to be able to bomb it out there 60, 70 feet. I like the touch. I like the performance. I like the feel when you, when you got a fish on. It, it, they're just really a great rod. And, and once we knew we were ready, we hit the go button and, and that's when we were just blown away by the support that we got from, you know, people, um, my audience that watches me on YouTube. And even now, or, you know, we continue to organically grow because these people are talking to other people about how awesome this rod is. You should totally check it out. So we've, we've continued to do really well in just our three months of, of being open for business because we, we built a product that, um, you know, that really is a, a great product that's, that's priced really well. So that's kind of the, the evolution of the, the fly rod business. And as a creator as well, you know, and as a creator on YouTube, I knew I was also in a very unique position, right? Um, I don't know any other creator out there that has a presence online that could partner up with somebody in this fashion, right? So it also carves out a little niche for myself as well um, because no one else can do what I'm doing, right? No one else has a relationship. It's a bit more than having a line of hoodies or a hat or something. Yeah, totally, right. And and I tried that once and <laughs> failed miserably. <laughs> oh, really? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to re-up that at some point. It's just, there's a lot of energy that goes into offering that type of merch. But, you know, I... I was able to, to check a few boxes, right, uh, on this, right? I wanted to be able to offer a, a top-end product and make it more accessible to people that necessarily didn't want to or couldn't afford that high-end gear. Um, you know, how cool is it to have your own fly rod with your own branding on it, right? So that's, that's pretty, pretty cool. pretty fucking awesome. I'm not going to lie. It's pretty, <laughs> it's, it's pretty cool. And, you know, who knows where it's going to go, right? It's, it's, you know, we positioned it as, as limited production, um, because, uh, you know, uh, you may or may not know, well, you probably know, everyone knows, right? Supply chain issues and things yep. like that. I mean, there's a chance potentially that there might be some components that would no longer be accessible to us mm -hmm. just because that's the way of the world. Um, but today we're still able to get uh, enough of the components to be able to continue to make the rods. But, you know, it may evolve into, into, a, into a different series at one point, but... You know, but for now we're we're still building fly rods, and we added a couple. You know, we expanded the lineup. We only started with a three, five, seven, and eight. We now have a three, four, five, uh, six, seven, and eight, and now just introducing a switch rod, a spay rod, trout spay, to the mix as well. So we're expanding our offering. But yeah, it's it's pretty cool. And um, at no point in my life did I ever think that I would own uh, a rod business. So <laughs> Neil and I are pretty excited about what we're doing, but that's kind of how it came, came to fruition. Awesome. I've, I have some questions. So your personal preference leading up to this is you liked fast rods. So why did you go medium fast? Did Neil talk you into it or how did that all shake out? No, I knew it was a, it was a discussion both with a lot of, uh, I've taught a lot of people to fly fish and I knew when I first purchased that, that Sage TCR, um, Gary Sandstrom, who used to run the morning, morning hatch fly shop in Tacoma since closed. Mm -hmm. But he says, you know, Dan, this, this is not an easy rod to cast. If you can get the dynamics down, it's going to be great, but it's not for the beginning fly caster. So he was kind of qualifying of where I was in the casting. So I knew that a fast action rod wouldn't necessarily be the right fly rod for my audience, right? My audience, I would say 60% of the my audience are people that are getting into fly fishing and are relatively new. So I knew that it wouldn't serve them well to be able to offer them a fast action rod that if you don't understand and have a, a really good casting stroke, it's going to be tough for you to cast. So we wanted something that give you best of both worlds, right? We didn't want a medium action because I just don't, for me, I don't like the, the sponginess, I guess you could say, in a medium uh, action rod. It's just a little bit too... 
too much wobble, I guess you can say, too mm -hmm. much flex. Mm -hmm. We wanted something in between that could still resonate with people that have been fly fishing a long time and, and want a faster action rod, but also to that beginner that needed something a little easier to cast. And what I found in myself, um, as you get older, you struggle with, you know, I have a little arthritis in my casting wrist. I was mm -hmm. getting kind of tennis elbow from casting mm -hmm. so much. When you have a medium fast action rod and you're putting a lot less effort into the cast, I haven't had any issues with my wrist, my tennis elbow, fly, fly fishing elbow that I was starting to get uh, and having to, you know, put the old biofreeze on it every <laughs> single time I went out fishing. That's gone. And that has to do with the fact that I'm putting a lot less effort to get the same result in this fly rod. So we tried to design a fly rod that would that would work well for the for the entry level starter, right? That's either just starting or only been doing it for a couple of years. And to the veterans, right? That just appreciate uh, a fly rod that, that casts a lot easier than a fast action. So that medium fast action was that perfect, um, that, you know, that perfect segue into what we were trying to offer as, as a product. So that's why we, we settled on that, that particular taper on the blank. And you probably know, well, I, you definitely know a lot more about rod terminology and how, what, what the taper or flex or all those terms mean that def define like how a rod bends. So you, you label it as a parabolic power taper. And I tend to think of like a glass rod or a bamboo rod that bends all the way down to the cork where modern rods don't usually bend past the midsection. Uh, is that different than like a medium fast rod? action or how, what does that even mean? Is that just marketing speak or what does it mean? <laughs> uh, it's a little bit of marketing speak, but it also speaks to the, the actual flex on the rod itself. So if you slow down a cast, uh, once you have, once you're carrying probably 30 feet of line and the rod is really starting to load, mm -hmm. you're going to notice that on this particular taper, it begins to bend just above the first section. So you have your cork in your first section, your first barrel going into the second section, there it's where it's starting to bend. Typically in a fast action, it's more of the top half of the rod that bends and the lower half essentially stays nearly stationary. So you have this, where the parabolic power taper comes into place, is you have this very even bend throughout the entire fly rod. And it's best illustrated in that slow motion video to where I was carrying probably 40 feet of line out and cast about 70 to 75 feet of line. Mm -hmm. And on that final presentation, when I was coming forward, you can see this, this bend that appears to start right at the cork, even though it's just above the cork that it begins. And it's this very even bend that goes all the way through the rod. So you have this, this you know, the rod that's transferring all of that energy into the fly line and also the the other important part right where the carbon fiber comes into place once that rod delivers all the energy and you do your hard stop it doesn't wobble or doesn't flex forwards where you lose some of that that uh, that power transfer and that's how a lot of times right tailing loops are created because mm. you have this uh, too much power and it creates kind of a a loop in the line and the line catches itself on the way by. Right. So with this type of taper and this type of transfer of energy, uh, the, that's, that's how it, I guess, uh, be able to delivers the line with, with relative ease. And what I've learned in the rod building industry is, you know, not all blanks are created equal, right? I leaned on Neil's, expertise when it came to all the fly rods that he's built over the years and gotten a lot of feedback and used them himself on what he felt would deliver what I was trying to achieve in this particular uh, performance of the rod. And, you know, we, we really, uh, we found something that he already trusted. And once I experienced it, I thought, wow, this really, this really does make a huge difference when casting. Right. When I took it out in the field, when I first got it built, I, I could tell that we had something pretty special when it came to the delivery system and how it casts. Because a lot of people, you know, that especially when they, they just start with fly fishing and they're, they're buying, you know, not very expensive gear, they get frustrated because a lot of times it's the rods not doing them any favors, right. When it comes to learning how to cast. So, um, we, we wanted to design something that, 
that would give somebody a good experience right out of the gate. And that's, that's what we feel we have with the, with the FFD rods. Well, I think designing it that way and going to market with a rod with that kind of design is definitely another unique selling point because that's just not very popular in the industry right now. Everyone wants a fast rod that, that they think will shoot a lot of line because it's so stiff. But I think I, I tend to favor rods that have more energy transfer like you're describing. So I, I would love to get one of your rods in my hands and feel it. But uh, I, I think that's definitely going to help you stand out in the market because like I said, that's just not really any modern rods that have that kind of profile. No, and I would, I would agree. And um, you know, the best I can sit and hear and say all these things, right. But the testimonials that are, are really is what uh, really counts, right? The, uh, the customers that have purchased our rod that have had similar experiences, it's humbling, right? To get, to get these emails just gushing about the rods and how awesome they are and it's a piece of art and it's you know, cast great it's everything you said it was it's humbling but it also you know it that's what we knew that we designed and that's what i've experienced as well so it didn't come as a surprise when we were getting that feedback um yeah so we're we know that we have a very a very special fly rod when it comes to the overall performance and uh you know they really are when when they're delivered to our customers, they they are a work of art because every single one of them is handmade from start to finish. So it's a it's a pretty pretty special looking rod as well as a special performing rod. Right on. Again, sometimes you know I I have to pinch myself. I can't believe believe <laughs> I have my own fly rod business. Um, but yeah, it's it's pretty pretty cool for sure. That's awesome. Well, I, I respect the entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, that's it's not for everybody. That's for sure. But. From Neil's point of view, I, I think of a custom rod builder as somebody who's slow, methodical, one-off rods here and there. And what's it like transitioning to more of a mass production kind of model? I, I mean, I'm not, I assume the numbers are still somewhat limited release. It's not like you're pumping out sage level quantity or anything. But uh, there is a difference, right, between just a custom rod builder and a production rod builder. Totally. And, you know, we've had to scale up somewhat now. You know, we we want to keep this as it is, grassroots, blue collar, family owned, right? We don't we don't want this to get really huge. You know, we we want to keep we want to keep the foundation of what it is in place, right? And and Neil and I have had this conversation before as well. Is as the rod orders were starting to stack. Onto, onto each other because um, all of a sudden, you know, we just kept getting more rods and more <laughs> rods and more rods. And, you know, we're probably 15 rods right now behind. Wow. So it's ta- it's taking us about four weeks to get a, uh, from a, an order to completion, four to five weeks. Okay. But at the same time, uh, even though I've, I've written a lot of emails saying, you know, I'm really sorry, you know, we, we're, you know, we, it's probably going to take us four to five weeks to get this rod to you. There hasn't been one person that's canceled their order because of it, right? Because they know we don't we don't have a production team. Right. It's one guy. Actually, it's one and a half guy now. So hmm. Kobe, you may have seen him in some of my videos. He's my stepson. Mm-hmm. He is being um, mentored on how to build a fly rod. So right now, Kobe is doing a lot of the wraps on the fly rod. So it's a, it's a very meticulous uh, thing to do, and it has to be perfect right he had a couple of rods that weren't part of the the uh, the offering that he practiced with and mm-hmm. we saw that he has a skill set right to really make a a very clean and um the best way to put it is a very clean wrap mm-hmm. on all of the guides and of course he you know we laser side all the guides down down the spline of the of the rod so they all line up perfectly he really does do a great job with with the wrap so he's now uh, wrapping a lot of our rods and Neil's working on building the rod seats and putting the corks together and finishing the rods. So we have, we are mentoring Kobe to, to, to take on more when it comes to the rod building, but we don't want to scale up any bigger than that. So what we ended up doing is Neil builds his own, uh, rod building, like they're basically a machine that holds the rod into place and can spin it wherever you need it to spin, right? Okay. That's a lot of times that's important when it comes to uh, finishing the rod because you got to keep that thing turning constantly so you mm. don't have the 
oxy pool anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, all of the thread and all of the wraps we do is still by hand, right? We're, we're turning them onto the rod itself. So that takes time. Um, but we did, he built a couple more of those machines so that we could have four rods drying at any given time. So that's helped reduce our lead times somewhat, uh, being able to have, have that. He also, we have his, uh, our shop is in a, um, uh, historical building in Stillicum, Washington. So it's this really cool looking mansion that, that has these different rooms. So we, we now rented out the conference room. So it's a little bit bigger space to put these, um, uh, rod building stations, uh, and just have more room, uh, to be able to dry more rods at a time. So that's helped us out a little bit. And, you know, sales too. I mean, we had our first month was ridiculous. Our second month was really good. It slowed down a little bit uh, for us in, in September, um, which I think is is usually kind of the case uh, as we're ramping up now towards the, the holiday season. So the sales have been some kind of up and down. It's hard to predict, mm-hmm. uh, but it's actually a good thing that it's uh, slowed down just a little bit because it allows us to catch up. Yeah. Right, to catch up. But, but that's we don't really want to get any bigger than that, right? I mean, we've, we've sold over 50 fly rods since we started, which wow. is pretty darn good when you consider, you know, uh, how many fly rods a, a, a small shop might sell, you know, 12, 12 rods a month kind of a thing. Yeah. So we're happy with, with, with the business that we have. We want to keep it where it's at, which is this, you know, small family-owned blue-collar business, right? Because that's what we are. Um, and we don't want to get too big. So we're, we're good with, uh, with trudging along at the sales level that we're, that we're at currently. Right on. I know that you want to keep it where it's at, but I'm thinking of the future and I know you fishing is still kind of like a side hustle for you. I mean, you have a day job. What do you think the future holds in that? I mean, are you going to be a full-time quote unquote professional fly fisherman because that's your job or, I mean, you're a rod builder, but uh, do you have other products in mind that don't require Neil or what do you, what are you thinking? Yeah. I mean, and I've gotten, I mean, <clears throat> overall, I think, you know, I don't know if you share the same dream or goal, but my dream would be able to work within the industry that I'm so passionate about. Mm-hmm. Um, I would love, I'm in sales today, sales leadership. Mm-hmm. I would love to apply everything that I've done in sales leadership over the decades that I've been in the industry that I'm currently in, into the fly fishing industry. I would love to do that. And that's kind of my long-term goal. So I've been taking steps, right, to potentially open up opportunities to do that. But today, it's very much still just a, a side hustle. I, I'm speaking at a fly club um, next week, um, kind of talking about a, a particular fishery. Um, I've got a couple of sponsorships, which have been great. I just recently signed a sponsorship with Cortland Flylines. Nice. Um, so love to see where that goes and where that potentially could take me. Um, I have a great relationship with the owners, uh, Sam and Nick of Drift Waiters. Mm-hmm. Now, granted, they're just basically a, a small family-owned company, but al- aligning myself with companies and products that I trust in the industry who knows what doors could open, right? Who knows what could happen with the, the fly rod business? Um, but absolutely, I would. It, it is a dream slash goal of mine to one day do this for a living, uh, to be able to pump all my passion right, that I have for fly fishing and, and make it a career rather than just a, a side hustle. So I'm, I'm doing some things to... to uh, to kind of make that, that come to fruition, the kind of the next, my next project that I'm looking into is having a membership platform because as you know, Eric, being a creator yourself, you know, what we do, um, you know, when it's on YouTube and it's on Facebook and it's on Instagram, it's all free to anyone that's, that, that wants to watch and, 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 uh, you know, learn from those platforms type of thing. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of time and energy that comes from, from us, the creator, so I'm looking at developing um, a membership platform to where I can do deeper dives in a lot of uh, when it comes to the, the learning aspects of fly fishing, stuff that wouldn't typically resonate on YouTube, right? Nobody wants to watch a 30-minute video on 
fly boxes or a 30 minute <laughs> video on different techniques or strategies or, you know, what, whatever the nuance might be, right. you have to be pretty quick and short and to the point when it comes to YouTube. I've had so many people reach out to me, both from YouTube comments to Instagram messages to emails asking me, Hey, you know, do you, do you teach? Do you do any lessons? Do you do any private lessons? Do you do any, uh, any type of the tutorials that are, you know, you want know, a guide, things like that. So I've had a lot of people reach out to me for some personal one-on-one -on -one time. And today my primary job doesn't allow that, right? Cause you have to balance the, the, the work, the time and work that goes into your career and your family. And then of course, what I do on the, 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 the side hustle, right. Or the passion, the hobby side of things. 100%. So having a membership platform, it would be kind of my next step on on getting closer to doing this for a living and having a specific place that our people that are passionate about fly fishing can go, can learn more about the sport, can interact with each other. Um, so that's kind of what I'm in the investigative stage of right now, seeing what the what the cost is associated with building something like that and, and whether or not I can invest enough time into it to make it, you know, that value proposition for any of them might want to be a member. So that's kind of the next step in what I'm, what I'm doing, getting closer to my goal. Yeah, I understand that. I, I have a sort of basic framework for one through, through YouTube. I don't have it outside like a Patreon, or I know you can self host them on your own website. Um, but that, that was definitely a big consideration was, do I have the time? And if I'm, you know, selling this package to someone, am I going to be able to deliver something that's valuable to them? I mean, that's, I don't want to just take their money. I know there's, you know, super fans out there that'll just, you know, spend some money because they want to keep seeing new videos coming, but uh, I can totally relate to, you know, wanting to have real high quality content that teaches someone something or entertains them or whatever it may be. Yeah. So that's, you know, I'm looking to see if that's realistic, you know, today, I think I, I think I can, right. And the, the cost associated for somebody that wants to be a part of this group, it's not going to be, you know, it's not going to be outlandish at all. Right. Um, you know, it's, you know, my goal is to, uh, for the cost of two cups of coffee a month from Starbucks, right. You could be, you can support me and be part of this, part of this membership as well. And, and also get something out of it, right. To where, whether it's ad free early release videos that you typically would later see on YouTube, but a lot of exclusive content that that's more uh, tutorial based and how to based as well from live streams, Q and A's, and then just also having like a group, um, almost like a chat room to write where people can bounce questions off each other and just be kind of a build my own fly fishing club, mm -hmm. albeit more, uh, you know, an E fly fishing club. Well, that's, kind of the direction it's all going in as younger and younger people join the sport it's uh, it's very much an online community i don't know how active the, the physical clubs are anymore these days but yeah and i you know what the other thing it's harder for me to do and and i think also helped with the growth of my youtube channel is that i've always engaged with my audience um replying to every single comment Minus, you know, the negative ones. Sometimes I'll engage. Don't engage feed one the, of the trolls. trolls. Don't feed them. <laughs> right. Sometimes I do it for fun, but I know it's not a healthy place to be. So I typically just ignore. Right. Um, that's getting harder and harder to do mm -hmm. on YouTube and trying to, because you have to go through all the comments, right, to get to the meaningful ones that I want to respond to. So by having a membership, uh, a site that's unique to YouTube, that people can go and connect more closely to me, um, know that they're going to get a response if they have a question or a video idea that they want me to do. So it'll help me continue to engage with the community, but in a in a specific um, kind of exclusive spot. Awesome. I think you've done it right as well. I, I have a, a buddy who wants to be a guide and he, uh, you know, he's getting all the paperwork in, in place, but he doesn't really have any audience. He wants to be independent, doesn't want to work through an outfitter or whatnot to get bookings. And I'm like, well, how are people going to find you? And uh, he's like, well, I'll open a Google business listing or whatever. I'm like, well, you need to have an audience. And people like you have put in the work, like you've been doing this for years now. And now after building an audience, you know, you're leveraging those, those eyeballs to, you know, 
I mean, you've been giving them value for free for all this time. And I think it's okay to once in a while ask for something in return. And uh, uh, that regard, I think you'll be very successful whenever you do open up uh, your, your community. I appreciate that. Thank you. Do you have prior audio video experience or has this just been one big learning experience? Well, if you go back into my catalog of videos three years ago, you'll see that I don't. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, the first videos are cringeworthy. In fact, I've got a, I've got a good story that kind of lends to um, when I leveled up. So it's been about two and a half years ago. You know, I had someone early on, one of my early audience members watching videos and were interacting with me. And one day I get a uh, email. It says, Hey, you know, I've been, uh, my name is James and I've been watching your videos for a long time. And he goes, uh, I think I've got a few pieces of advice for you that'll help you with your storytelling and editing in trade. If you'll tell me where your secret Alpine Lake is. Mm. And he'd mentioned, you know, James, you know, what pulled at my heartstrings is I learned, you know, one of the things he said is that he didn't know how much time he had left on this earth, right? He was still, he was going through cancer treatment at that particular yeah. point. He's in remission now. Awesome. Um, and, you know, I, of course, like, of course, right, I'm, I'm going to engage with this person. So, and when he sent me that message, he sent me a picture of an Emmy. Mm, like and of course, in the Emmy. beginning... Like a real Emmy. Okay. Well, at first I thought I was being catfished, right? So I was trying to look at this. And I'm like, is this real type of thing? And then he sent me a close-up of four Emmys. And when I zoomed up on his name, there was his name. Wow. So he is an Emmy award-winning director producer for a local news outfit out of Seattle. Okay. He's since retired. So he knew his stuff. He's got right? chops. So, Right. So it's like, all right, this, this guy's legit. So we ended up connecting and he gave me some tips on storytelling and editing that really evolved my storytelling and editing to where it's at today. And I took him to my secret subalpine lake and we fished together and we immediately became friends. And he's, he's one of my uh, better friends today. He just love the guy. Um, but, you know, and that's another right sidebar to, to this is, is even though you get you get your few trolls right that love to troll you on YouTube, some of the relationships that I've forged and people that I've met because of YouTube, um, you know, really has just it's been incredible. Uh, people that I would have never run into or have had the opportunity to connect with, uh, being able to connect with some of these amazing human beings has really been really the best part about what I'm doing on on YouTube and James being one of those people. So that's when my editing skills started to level up a little bit. And I'm still, you know, it's, it's a party of one. I do it all. I use uh, Filmora is the um, platform that I'm most familiar with. And, you know, I've always had an active imagination when I was a young kid. So one of my favorite things to do is to take a bunch of footage that I recorded in a day and then tell the story in the editing room because I can relive it and I can tell it the way that I want to. And that's why a lot of times, even though it's annoying for some people, I put music behind it because I'm trying to get out, you know, in my head. Sure, and, evoke an emotion. Yeah, build it into the story, kind of how I felt in that moment. And it's fun to do that. And, you know, a lot of it, it's for me, right? So I can look back on these trips. It's for my kids so they can look back and on these trips, it's for my eventual grandkids so they can see how cool their grandpa was, you know, when they look back on these videos. So, you know, I know I can still improve when it comes to the editing room, you know, from using J cuts to L cuts to, to make the experience a little more pleasurable for the viewer, which I'm getting better at each, each video. I try to, the fact you even know what those are is a testament to what, you know, you're uh, downplaying your skill just a bit. Well, I appreciate it. I watch a lot of, so one of the, there's, three places that I subscribe to on YouTube that have helped me a ton as well. So James has helped me a lot in the storytelling, mm -hmm. but vidIQ, Film Booth, mm -hmm. and I um, can't remember the, he's since Nate Black, I think his name is. They've, they've helped me out a ton with understanding the platform YouTube, mm -hmm. understanding better ways to edit and storytell, uh, and just doing it better, you know, understanding YouTube better. Uh, so they've helped me out a ton with 
with uh, some of the things that I do today in my videos just to make f for a better viewing experience for anyone that might tune in. Well, yeah, you touched on trying to optimize content on YouTube or just title and thumbnail. I mean, that, that aspect of the video or content creation is even a level above editing and storytelling. It's uh, frustrating sometimes. I've got a few other fly fishing YouTubers and we're all just kind of trying to learn together and we'll bounce ideas off each other and like, Oh, that's going to be a, you know, a banger video. And then wah, 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 the algorithm says, no. Nope. And, uh, <clears throat> just try to learn from it every day. But it's, it's, it's a lifetime of learning. I think it is. And you know, it's, uh, what, what goes viral a lot of times on YouTube is things that are sensational. Right. Um, uh, but that doesn't always happen in fly fishing, right? No. <laughs> there's not, there's not any, you know, I, I suppose I can take my float tube and launch it from the top of a dam, right? And then dive, <laughs> dive down to some it class or, fours in it. Right. Or take my inflatable kayak down a waterfall. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, those things might, they might kill me, but they would probably get better views. Like one of my best viewed videos recently, right? So I have a couple casting tutorials that are now that are pushing a hundred thousand views, wow. but they've been on YouTube for a while. Okay. Um, I had an incident that happened on a, um, and I, and I, I don't want to spot burn. <laughs> That's one thing I've learned also not to do is hotspot on YouTube. Right. But there's a particular place that have these really big bull trout that are tough to catch. Okay. And I was fishing for trout. Wasn't actually going after bull trout in that, that time. I hooked a white fish and this 30 plus inch bull trout oh, came up and tried crap. to eat the white fish. <laughs> and I captured that all on film and it was super cool. And when I posted that video, I figured, you know, it might do okay. Right out of the gate, you know, it, it went viral for me, mm -hmm. right, to where it's over 50,000 views in just a few weeks' time. And typically, you know, so my videos might be... it's a short or a full-length video? It's a full-length full, full length video. Okay. So immediately, uh, it, it, when I say viral, viral for me, right? Anything that gets 50,000 views right out of the gate is a viral for me. Um, but because it was sensational, right? It was something that, that people were curious to, right, uh, about what what tried to eat your fish and the fact that people could relate to it, right? Because people that have fished uh, a trout long enough, right? They're going to have a bigger fish trying to eat the fish that might be on the end of their line. Uh, and it ended up going, but, but the overarching difference was that it was a sensational moment that I caught on camera. So not always, or very rarely does something that's inspirational ever go viral mm -hmm. type of thing. And it's just, you know, Trying to chase that viral hit anyway could be unhealthy when you're on YouTube. So I'm ha I'm happy with uh, with my view count and the audience that takes the time to watch and the engagement that I get, even though I don't you know have hundreds of thousands of views. Yeah, I mean, I'm not anywhere near those kind of view counts on my videos. So I I mean fifty thousand nothing to I mean you, you think about lining up fifty thousand people on a football field, that's a lot of freaking eyeballs. So it <laughs> it's is. a lot to be proud of. Even a thousand people, that's a full auditorium so, even a hundred people yeah imagine standing in front of a hundred people talking about fly fishing right that's uh, that's a big group it's a lot of people i once and the, also that's i was gonna say i once in the past did this little mini documentary about a guy who ran a 300 mile race he was trying to put together and um we did a live viewing in our local town so it was i mean it had local appeal and it was like an outdoor you know projected screen and we had maybe 400 people there on this big field and i was just blown away just to see that many people sitting there to watch something I made. And I just try to remember that every time I post a video and it's a thousand views. I mean, that's a thousand people. That's pretty awesome. It is. And you know, the other thing that's helped me early on to level up my, my YouTube game is mentally, right? Because I know that when some, when you, when the first view comes in on a video, that is a person like you and I that took the time to click the video and watch it. So when I changed my mindset to talk to that one person mm -hmm. that took the time to watch the video is when things really also started to evolve for me because I am in my mind, when I'm talking to my iPhone, I am talking to that one person that took the time to click on that video. And when that mindset when I put that mindset into place is when things also started to change for me as far as growth because I can connect to that one person because I'm 
talking to that one person mm -hmm. that decided to click on the video. Now, granted, that's several people that decide to watch that video, but I'm talking to that one person that took the time to watch every time. 100%. I think it's also hard to look at a lens and talk to it. And then when you can sort of, uh, what's the word? Uh, anapromorphize. Visualize. Or, yeah, visualize. I mean, that's a simpler word uh, to you know, look at that and see that's a person and you're just having a conversation. I think you can talk more comfortably and just be yourself. I mean, I know you talked about authenticity in one of your podcasts and I think that really comes through. I, you're probably one of the most genuinely happy people fishing and I know it's not fake. You can just tell. Like there's some people out there that when they're doing their voiceovers for their fishing videos, it's a, it might be a little pretentious or forced or you can tell they're reading a script. Um, and authenticity right. is, I think, one of your you know, superpowers for sure. I appreciate that. And people that know me and have been fishing with me a long time know that I get, uh, I've always gotten, I don't know what it is. Whenever I get into any fish, it's every fish is a good fish. Every fish yep. is a big fish. I just get really ramped up. And, and, uh, for me, you know, when I'm out there fly fishing, I don't think of anything else but what I'm doing. And, um, to be able to share that has been pretty cool. Yeah, for sure. And it, it's an honor and a privilege being able to you know, share our adventures and have people have any interest at all, I think. And I, I think yeah. you've built trust with enough people that your fly rod business is going to be a, a banger for as long as you decide to keep doing it. I think you're going to be successful at that or whatever future stuff you add on. So I'm, I'm excited to see where it goes. It's been fun sort of watching you. I remember, I think I first discovered you, I don't know, maybe where I'm at now, around two or 3,000 subs, and you've just continued to skyrocket, and it's fun to watch. Thank you. Appreciate you being a part of it too, Eric. Thank you. Well, maybe one day we can get up and fish together. I, I'm not that far away. It's, a, I mean, a full day's drive, but uh, I mean, if you're in Bend right now, we're, I could have uh, scooted up there and hung out, but one of these days we'll make it happen. Yeah, for sure. All right, Dan. Well, thank you for sharing uh, your story. I think a lot of people like to nerd out about I don't know, how you, I don't know, it just seems like you said, there's no one out there, a content creator who has a fly rod business. So that's pretty awesome, and uh, I like nerding out on that. If anyone else does too, cool. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. So thank you for giving me some time to talk about that too. So appreciate that. Oh, anytime. Until, until next time, man. Take it easy. All right. Thanks, Eric. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. If you aren't yet, go check out Fly Fish Dan on YouTube and check out his fly rods at fishonrods.com. And just in case you guys didn't know, I'm a guide now and the fall fishing has been fantastic. So if you want to take a trip with me, come on over and see my availability at driftstone.co. See you guys on the water.